Hey, this week I'm joined by Mark Honigsbaum. He's a writer and a journalist specializing in the history and science of infectious disease. He's a regular contributor to The Observer and The Lancet. He's a lecturer in the Department of Journalism at City University of London. Uh, and he's the author of a, a must-read book. It's The Pandemic Century, A History of Global Contagion from the Spanish Flu to COVID-19. So this is a history of pandemics, but we can't escape the fact that we're living through one. So if you were to select a, a single historical parallel for COVID-19, what, what would you go for? What's the best precedent for what we're living through? Uh, well, I mean, you, you would expect me to say this as a historian. There isn't, no two pandemics are exactly alike. Uh, it's often compared to the 1918 influenza pandemic. But even that isn't really accurate because um, that killed many orders, more people than I think COVID is likely to kill, devastating as it is. Um, and of course, it was a different pathogen, influenza, although it was a respiratory pathogen. Um, but I think that is the nearest uh, historical comparison. The other one I'd pick out is um, either SARS in 2002 or Ebola in 2014, neither of which became global pandemics. but uh, they both had the potential to. And I think the crucial question that everyone's asking is, could we have seen this coming? So we, we had the SARS outbreak, as you've said, in 2003, swine flu in 2009, Ebola in 2014, and you talk about Zika in Brazil in 2015. Now, do you think, do you think governments could have seen this, this pandemic coming? Well, um, in a way, scientists did see this pandemic coming. Um, scientists and health experts, there were no end of warning that we should expect another pandemic. Um, but it is true, we didn't know precisely which pathogen would spark that pandemic. Um, the most likely candidate and the, the one that all the pandemic uh, preparedness plans was modeled on was influenza. Uh, and most of the betting in the early 2000s was on um, some avian influenza, a novel bird flu like H5N1 or H7N9 would be the one that sparked the global pandemic. Um, but, uh, you know, because it was unclear precisely which pathogen would do that, the WHO came up with a new category after Zika uh, in 2017, and they labeled it disease X. And that was basically to denote that um, a pandemic could be caused by a virus currently unknown to medical science. Um, so even though we didn't know precisely which pathogen might spark it, we knew that it could be something either that we had already seen before, or uh, just as likely it would be a completely new unknown pathogen. Um, so of course that does make it very hard to predict, uh, but you can you know, lay, put plans in place so that you're ready for whichever pathogen does, you know, cause that pandemic. What's been unprecedented about this pandemic has been the responses from governments to it. So the, the shutdowns and uh, it, the real imposition of policies to encourage social distancing. So why have we taken the drastic action this time when we didn't in the past? Have we got more compassion? Do we see economic concerns as, as less important than life? What's, what, what's your opinion? Um, so, uh, your, 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 so your question is predicated on the assumption that we didn't do these things in past pandemics. Um, so that's not quite true. I mean, so if you go back to, um, you know, the plague pandemics in the 17th century, that's where in Italy and other countries in Europe, we first fought in quarantines and lazarettos, you know, um, hospitals, isolation centers where people would, they could be taken and isolated from the rest of the community. Um, and to a certain extent, although it wasn't, you know, in a direct or controlled way, um, you know, people did distance themselves. So there's a famous example of a village called Iam. EYAM, you've probably heard of it, um, in the Peak District in Derbyshire, where villagers, when they realized that they were infected with the plague, um, took it upon themselves to isolate the village from their neighboring hamlets in an attempt to stop plague spreading. Um, 
but you, you are right. It is the case that there's never been quarantines on the scale of, for instance, the lockdowns we saw in Wuhan and other Chinese cities. That's true. That's never happened in the whole history of medicine. And indeed, um, most uh, public health experts and indeed most historians like myself never uh, anticipated or contemplated that it would be possible to um, restrict the movement of modern urban population. You know, we're talking about tens of millions of people in the case of these Chinese megacities. Um, so that, that is new. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, it did happen in 1918, um, not so much in Europe because, you know, France, England, Germany um, were embroiled in the First World War and um, the war took, had priority. You couldn't really stop the wartime economy. Um, so, you know, people still had to continue going to munitions factories, the soldiers had to continue passing between England and, you know, the front in northern, northern France. But in the several American cities, uh, you know, there were restrictions on public gatherings. People, um, uh, you know, they canceled, um, you know, big parades, public, public gatherings. Um, and, you know, there were fa face mask ordinances. Um, and that even happened to a certain degree in cities like Manchester, where we had uh, public health officers who were particularly far-sighted and realized that this is the one thing you can do to restrict the pathogen. Um, the other part of your question seemed to go to this issue of whether we're somehow more, um, you know, willing to protect, um, you know, prioritize health as opposed to the economy today. Um, I think even that's a, a sort of a debatable question. I mean, you've seen the tremendous pushback um, particularly in the United States and in other countries with populist um, administrations who have been doing the opposite. They've been prioritizing the economy and uh, locking down very half-heartedly and then re releasing restrictions as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, I've encouraged that, you know, um, most countries have sooner or later seen that you just can't allow, um, you know, a vulnerable elderly members of the population to die in, in large numbers, and that that really should take priority over the economy. Uh, but even now, we're at the point where people are saying, "Well, if we continue these economic restrictions any longer, they could they could in themselves have dire health consequences." Uh, no, no, you're right. I, I phrased that question very poorly, and no, no, I, I, of, <laughs> of, of course, these. Um, we, we've come to learn that there are a lot of false dichotomies in this, aren't there, between life and the economy and between uh, taking severe action and taking minimal action. But um, what have you well, made I would, of... I would say this, I think, so um, uh, So false di dichotomy, I don't think it's actually a false dichotomy. I think it's a very real choice that... Um, so the way I put it is, um, you know, we, we live in both you know, um, an economic market, right? But there's also a moral mm. economy. Um, and uh, what makes um, the measure, arguably, of any uh, developed, civilized, democratic society is the degree to which it's willing and able to protect the most vulnerable and disadvantaged members of that society. So that's the moral question that the coronavirus and this unprecedented pandemic presents us with on a political and moral level. Um, where it gets difficult, of course, is where you could argue that the economic restrictions actually reduce your ability to act morally in defense of people who are vulnerable. So for instance, if, you know, the, you know, the, the GDP falls low enough and you know we can't actually afford to fund you know adequate health care that could really be very dire right for all sorts of reasons i mean i think we're quite a long way from that but you know these are the sort of these are the real dichotomy you know that we're having to weigh up and of course we're not finished with it in this country covid19 is going to be with us for months and years 
probably. But what what have you made of the UK's uh, response to it so far? What, what what have they got right? What have they got wrong? Well, I mean, the, the problem in the UK is like many countries in Europe and you know in the north, right? Um, at the beginning, we just refused to believe that what we were seeing, uh, you know, every night on our TVs from China could actually, you know, happen here in, in our own backyard. Um, I mean, overall, uh, I think the response has been woefully inadequate, if not amateur amateurish. Um, so I think we've seen very much in the UK, uh, you know, I don't know how you want to characterize it, but um, this kind of like, kind of almost hapless, haphazard response. You know, uh, I don't want to, you know, call Boris Johnson names in particular, because I think he is fundamentally decent. Uh, but you can see that behind the scenes, there's been this tug of war between this sort of libertarian tendency, uh, which is, first of all, to really, even though we were told the government was following the side, um, you, the first question you have is, well, well, what science were they following? Uh, because there's always, you know, conflicting uh, scientific evidence, particularly at the beginning of a pandemic. So the idea that you can simply follow the science was always, um, uh, you know, untenable. Um, somebody had to make a judgment, and that was always going to be a political judgment. Uh, and the fact is that uh, Britain and um, the United States and other countries really failed to act early enough. So we now know if they'd locked down, say, two weeks earlier, we would have definitely flattened the curve much sooner uh, and not had, I mean, we have the worst uh, numbers of deaths from COVID of any country in Europe. I think we're the third worst worldwide. Uh, so that tells you alone that, you know, we didn't do things that other countries got right. Um, and what's really striking is the countries that responded, um, you know, most vigorously and suppressed uh, the vi virus um, the most, you know, really in, in a hard way that, that you needed to, were by and large those countries in Southeast Asia, which had had recent direct experience of SARS in 2002 and 2003, and knew that it was different from influenza. It was different because you could suppress the infection with um, rigorous trap and test, you know, trap and uh, test. Uh, and that's really what we got wrong. You know, um, the countries that seemed to have done well were ones that where the political leaders either listened to public health experts, or as in the case of Australia, handed over the whole response to public experts and said, you're the experts, you handle this. Um, and that was a much wise, wiser strategy, both from the point of view of, you know, protecting population, but also the politicians themselves, because, you know, by handing over responsibility to public health, they could say, you know, the scientists are responsible. Uh, here we, you know, it's changed from day to day, right? Um, we never know which science we're going to follow on which day, you know, is it going to be the science that says face masks don't reduce transmission, or is it going to be the one that says no face masks do, do, do reduce that? We'll, we'll talk about China. And so, so in the book, that I'll pick out a quote from uh, what you say. You say this was China's Chernobyl moment. Um, now, do you still hold that view? Because uh, some people su suggest that their policies have actually been successful in that they managed to broadly contain the virus within the Hubei province. Um, or, or, or do you think this was a real disaster for the CCP and China generally? No, no, I, I certainly think that. So I think you have to distinguish between two phases of the Chinese response. Um, so when I wrote about it being their Chernobyl moment, I mean, the point about Chernobyl was it was a massive cover, right? Um, and, you know, many weeks were lost when radiation was leaking out. Uh, and, you know, many people got radiation poisoned as a result and died. Maybe wouldn't have. Uh, and the same thing is true in, in China. We, we now know uh, that. Uh, the coronavirus was already circulating in Wuhan as early as December the 1st. Um, certainly, uh, clinicians uh, working in hospitals in Wuhan uh, were raising the alarm um, in the first week of January. And we also know that 
no sooner did they start sharing that information about an unusual SARS-like illness than both the hospital authorities and the political authorities um, cracked down on those social media posts and indeed disciplined uh, several of the doctors, including um, this China's whistleblower, Li Wenliang, uh, who ended up then treating coronavirus patients, dying and becoming a martyr. Um, so um, the good thing that China did, which was different from SARS in 2002, when this period of denialism and cover-up lasted actually for many months, is that they did share the genomic sequence of the virus. So unlike HOV AIDS, where it took something like two years for scientists to even work out that it was you know, a new retrovirus and sort of describe its, its genetic makeup, we knew by January the 11th the whole sequence of this virus, and that was published online. But what wasn't still being shared in mid-January was this mounting evidence that um, the virus was being spread from person to person, so it was transmitting freely from person to person. That's a ma massive wake-up call for a pandemic respiratory virus. Uh, and also that there seemed to be quite a few asymptomatic infections. Now, I don't think China can be held accountable for not sharing that because they didn't really know. I mean, nobody knows. We can still see today there's so many unknowns, so many, so much information that is still cloudy and uncertain. Um, but so China really wasted about three weeks from January 1st to around the 23rd when they then locked down Wuhan and then you saw these unprecedented restrictions on the city. Um, and once we saw them building these new hospital waiting rooms overnight and mobilizing, um, you know, uh, tens of thousands of health workers and the military, that was something that only a communist, you know, autocratic regime could probably do. So on that score, yes, I think China should be applauded for once they did realize what was going on, they did everything they could to close it down. Um, but I do think that secrecy and that lack of transparency in that initial period was a missed opportunity because that was a time when maybe we could have stopped the infection um, spreading more widely from China. I think it was probably already out of China in December, maybe even earlier than that. But, you know, we still had people flying from Wuhan and other Chinese purposes all over the world. So that really should have been. And I, I spoke to Martin Reese a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him a similar question to this one. In, in that, do you think the slow response in the UK and the US, in particular, has shown us that, in terms of the way that we uh, our, our mitigation strategies, do you think we we invest resources in the wrong place, or we or we see pandemics as a as a lesser threat to terrorism or um, nuclear? nuclear war or, 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 or anything really? Do you think pandemics are treated with less seriousness? Yeah, I mean, I forget the figures, but I, I did look them up. But yeah, if you compare, um, you know, the level of spending on pandemic preparation to the level of spending on, um, you know, nuclear deterrence, you know, the height of the Cold War or, or military hardware, it certainly, you know, um, comes way down those rankings in terms of defense. Um, but it's not just about specific spending on, um, you know, uh, stockpiling uh, drugs or masks or respirators. Um, it, it's about also investing properly in public health. And, you know, not just sort of, um, you know, people who can do contact tracing or can be mobilized, you know, when there is a pandemic. But I mean, public health more broadly, you know, hospitals and your whole public health system. So again, we've seen that countries that have had good pandemics, in quotes, such as Germany, um, spend very much more per head on health. Um, and the result of that is they have many more ventilators um, per head of population. They have more ICU beds. Uh, but more importantly, uh, they're spending, you know, you can get good quality health care almost anywhere in Germany. Um, that money isn't concentrated in major teaching hospitals in metropolitan areas. And therefore, if you're out in Suffolk where I am now, 
or, or Wales, where you are now, you'll, you may get less good care because those hospitals are less well resourced. So I think a lot of this <coughs> is about recognizing that, I mean, particularly as um, it's very unlike, it's very likely that we'll have more pandemics in the future, right? One of the major lessons for me is, after all, why are we having to stop the economy? Why are we having to um, social distance on an unprecedented scale? You could argue that this pandemic could have been a very manageable crisis, if not for the fact that it turned into a health crisis, right? So if we had adequate public hospitals and adequate numbers of beds and fully staffed uh, ICUs, we could have dealt with the surge of patients. We could have managed that while continuing our normal activity. The only reason we've got this crisis is because of the decade-long underfunding of public health uh, in this country, but also, you know, uh, worldwide. So the, the book's a history of pandemics from the last hundred years. So we'll get into the most serious one, the, obviously the Spanish influenza of 1918-19. Now, can you give listeners a bit of background into what 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 caused that that pandemic and uh, how serious it was well so the 1918 influenza we know was caused by um, a bird flu virus that probably transit transited into human populations pretty rapidly um, uh, it could have made that jump as early as 1917 um, or it could have been much closer to the first observed human outbreaks which were in May of 1918. Uh, the reason we know all this is because in uh, 2005, um, scientists in the United States and National Institutes of Health, uh, working with other scientists worldwide, managed to reconstruct the genome of the virus. And they did it by um, basically going to places where there'd be bad outbreaks, including in Alaska, and um, unearthing, um, uh, you know, people who were died and buried uh, in the permafrost. And because those, those people were buried in permafrost, it meant that their lung tissue uh, was preserved and hadn't decayed. And they were able to fish out um, fragments of the virus from this preserved lung tissue. Um, so it was really a remarkable achievement. It gave us huge insight into uh, how pandemics may start. Um, so influenza typically circulates in human populations all the time. But there are also a similar related virus circulating in pigs and swine. But they all seem to start as uh, wild viruses in wild waterfowl, ducks, geese, turds. Um, so it appears that the 1918 virus was a classic bird flu virus um, that then got into human populations. Uh, and because of that, um, people had no or little immunity to it. And that really is the key thing to understand when you're trying to understand what makes a pandemic virus, right? The key thing about a pandemic virus is that it has to be able to spread easily from one person to another. Um, ideally, from the virus's point of view, um, it won't make, it'll make, make a lot of people sick, but not so sick that they're disabled and unable to spread the virus to other people. So a successful virus is one that spreads freely. Uh, most people might have a mild illness, um, and that enables it to you know, reach a large, large percentage of the population. But the other key thing is that um, typically people don't have any immunity or very little immunity to a pandemic virus. And that's why, uh, in some members of the population, it can cause these really, really severe um, responses. Um, and that's what we're seeing now, and that's what we saw in 1918. Um, so something like uh, a quarter of the British population uh, were infected with the Spanish flu, and it had a very similar mortality rate to COVID. Um, depending on where you were, it was roughly 1% to 2% uh, of people of cases uh, ended up in fatal outcomes. Uh, of course, if you went to um, countries like India, you know, uh, where there were lots of other diseases and like poor, poor in nutrition and health in general, um, the case fatality rate um, could be much higher, as high as five, six, maybe seven, eight um, percent. 
and in places where people had no ex previous exposure to influenza whatsoever, such as remote Polynesian islands, um, when the influenza arrived, it wiped out something like half those indigenous populations. Um, so you really need to understand that immunity and what level of background immunity populations have is crucial to, you know, um, making a pandemic a true pandemic. And uh, the, the Spanish flu cl it claims 50 million lives, and that's five times more than the number of lives who were claimed by the First World War. So what, what do we know that governments got wrong? Well, I mean, <laughs> there was no... Um, so first of all, people didn't know that it was a virus. Um, you know, at the time, um, medical science was still very much in the area of bacteriology. Uh, so um, we had the laboratory tools, um, to culture and study bacteria. Uh, and we could even visualize them through an optical microscope. Um, and most people thought that influenza uh, was caused by a bacillus called Haemophilus influenzae, um, which you know, is just a commensal bacteria that lives in the nose and throat, as do many uh, bacteria. Streptococcus is another one. Um, and a lot of these bacteria uh, are associated with um, you know, pneumonia. Um, the community of pneumonia. Um, and, you know, bacteriologists, um, because they frequently found um, Haemophilus influenza in the nose and throats of influenza patients, um, concluded that this was the pathogen in influenza. So they didn't know that it was a virus, they had the wrong pathogen. Uh, but more importantly, people in 1918 didn't think of flu as a plague like disease. Why? Uh, for the same reasons that most people today dismiss flu as, you know, a generally mild illness, a seasonal illness that you see every winter. Um, you know, it may pose a threat to um, elderly people, 80s and above, who have compromised immune systems or are prone to asthma and other um, bronchial or respiratory conditions. But for most of us, by which I mean, you know, most fit young people, um, it's just a, an inconvenience, right? It's, it's an excuse for a few days off work. How many times have you heard that you have man flu, which is, you know, um, a way of derogating, uh, you know, men when they're ill and saying they're just faking, lying about. Uh, and that's the way people have always thought of flu. People have said, oh, it's only flu. But of course, anyone who's had flu knows that it can be a really debilitating illness, right? Um, Many people say they've had flu when they've only had, you know, a mild cold. When you have flu, you know it. You know, it hits you very suddenly like a truck. You know, it's like being run over, knocked off your feet. And, you know, you literally can't, you don't have any energy to do very much except lie prone in bed. Um, and, you know, wait until you get better, which can take two, three, maybe four weeks or more. Um, so, People really didn't think of flu as something that could cause, um, you know, a plague-like pandemic-style disease, even though they had seen a very big pandemic in 1890, so uh, only 20, uh, sorry, thir almost 30 years before the 1918 pandemic. But the other thing was that, um, you know, we didn't have a developed um, hospital system in the UK or other countries. We didn't even have a Ministry of Health, right? There was no Department of Health or equivalent of Matt Hancock standing up every day, giving briefings to the whole nation. Uh, the nearest thing was uh, something called the Local Government Board, uh, which essentially had been set up to administer uh, 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 hospitals under the poor law. So these were the, um, uh, the hospitals where people without any funds to pay for private medical insurance could go for care. It was funded through the collection of, you know, through the poor law. Um, uh, but generally speaking, it was left to local um, public health officers, uh, either in London or Manchester, or even on a borough level, to decide on what was the best way of uh, managing infectious disease outbreaks within their community. And what you saw uh, in 1918 was, even across London, some local authorities, so the local government board 
didn't give a direction on schools, whether they should be open or closed. Um, quite similar to the debates we've seen today where, you know, um, England, Scotland, and Wales are all handling this issue differently. And even in London, some boroughs chose to close schools, others says no, said no, it's better to keep schools open. Um, so I find that quite interesting. A lot of the debates that people had in 1980, you know, is it better to wear masks or not wear masks? If you're sick with influenza, should you open the window to increase ventilation? Or would that risk more germs coming in and infecting you? Um, so they did have these debates, um, but there was no sort of central public health messaging, uh, very rudimentary. I mean, people were told to isolate at home if they were sick. In some uh, places like Manchester, where they had enlightened uh, medical officers officer that could have helped, handbills were distributed, um, um, flyers were put up around the city, telling people, for instance, you know, to avoid going to work if they could, to avoid riding trams or trains. Um, but that wasn't the case in London, and uh, it wasn't the case in even in most cities in America. Uh, so what happened essentially was that. Uh, the virus was allowed to run its course uh, and infect, uh, as I said, up to a third of the population. We'll talk about another serious pandemic, which is HIV and AIDS. Um, so I think in 2018, as, as many as 40 million people across the world uh, had, had HIV, um, had AIDS, sorry. And uh, why have we failed to eradicate that disease? Um, very very easy you don't have a vaccine okay so this comes it all comes back to what i was saying at the beginning it's, it's, it's about immunology right um you know uh bill clinton famously said to win the election it's, it's about the economy stupid um, i don't mean to call you stupid uh, or anyone but it's about immunology stupid mm. this is what a lot of people still don't get there's a lot of wishful thinking now like i say we've had these huge outbreaks uh, in London, Spain, and Italy. Phew, a lot of people want to believe it's over. You know, we're in this like this this period of summer where people are being allowed to, you know, uh, resume a modicum of normal act of activity. But this virus will come back uh, because we know from serology testing that at most, no more than six to seven percent of the population have actually been exposed to the virus and may have immunity. I say may because we don't know if exposure mm. to the virus actually gives you long-lasting immunity. But we, what we, we do know or what we assume based on the model of um, the epidemiolo epidemiological modeling is that until 70% of the population has immunity, then the virus will continue to transmit. And that's why the HIV AIDS is still a pandemic. So this virus emerged in, well, we first recognized it in 1980-81, but we now know it was already circulating in uh, Haiti in the United States in the early 1970s. So it was circulating invisibly under the radar until enough individuals, in this case, um, you know, men who had sex with men in a place like Los Angeles in New York, started going to um, hospital emergency rooms with these strange symptoms. Um, the good news about HIV is that you know through tremendous you know scientific research and sharing of knowledge we've managed to produce a cocktail of drugs which can uh, depress uh, the virus and treat these opportunistic infections so you can now live with hiv for many years uh, but people still harbor the virus um, they're still spreading it if they have unprotected sex uh, and that means that unless we can have a vaccine we, we, there's no hope of eradicating it in human population. And the same is true, I'm afraid, of COVID-19. Um, the only other, opportunity, the only other uh, scenario is that it just becomes an endemic illness like influenza that we face every year. Let's talk about SARS from 2003. Uh, where, where does that originate? And I, I want to ask you about why did that not have the, the spread that covid 19s had? Well, I mean, so uh, two reasons, essentially. So um, SARS had a much shorter incubation period. And when people did develop illness, the symptoms were much more marked. 
effects. So it was kind of unmistakable. Um, you know, you were very unlikely to have SARS and be walking around and not realize it. Um, so, I mean, as soon as people uh, started to feel unwell, they felt so unwell that they typically presented at emergency rooms and hospitals. Um, and that is indeed where the first cases were recognized. And as soon as people presented those emergency rooms, SARS very quickly infected the doctors, nurses, and health workers who were treating them. So it was an explosive disease. That and it typically the good news is it was because it was so explosive the patients went to hospital. It didn't get out into the community nearly as much as this version was, sometimes called SARS two, the coronavirus. It's eighty percent similar to SARS one, but those differences, genetic differences, are crucial. Um, the other the other key factor is that SARS one um, had a much higher attack rate, clinical attack rate. Um, mortality rate was in excess of 10%. Uh, so again, you know, when people got ill, they got very severely ill, and then, you know, there was a high number of deaths. Again, that reduced the amount of people who were able to sort of spread the virus to the population. But I think the really crucial thing is this incubation period. Um, so we know that you, you can, uh, transmit SARS, you, you can, you know, become ill from the coronavirus as early as five, six days after infection. But it could be as long as 14 days. And that's quite a long period. Um, and most people um, were not quite clear on how many people can spread it asymptomatically in this 14 day window period. Uh, there's some suggestions that it can be up to 24 or 48 hours before you develop noticeable symptoms. But that raises a lot of questions because a lot of people don't really notice that they've got symptoms, even when they're having symptoms of SARS. They might just think they've got a cold or they're feeling a bit under the weather. So this is, what, this is one of the big problems. You know, you may not notice you've got symptoms when you're actually doing, you're transmitting it or you could be transmitting it before you have any symptoms. Uh, that window means that there's always going to be this huge lag between the virus, you know, setting up these transmission chains and it becoming explosive enough four, five, six wait, weeks later that we actually recognize it. Um, we see it in health settings and therefore we wake up to the fact that, oh, this thing has been here all this time. Um, so that's what, it's really a very sneaky, insidious virus compared to SARS-1. And I'll ask a similar question about Ebola. So Ebola's got a fatality rate of around 50% in some areas, I believe. Um, but why, why is it, uh, its, its ability to spread around the world, why, why has that been limited? Well, I mean, so precisely because of that. So, you know, uh, Ebola is um, one of these diseases that, you can't mistake when somebody when somebody comes down with you know the full florid symptoms of Ebola. Uh, I mean, typically, you know, uh, in the worst cases, anyway, they leak bodily fluids um, and they're very, very severely ill. Um, they can't move about very much, uh, and you know, as you said, unless they get to uh, an ICU unit where they can be given you know lots of fluids and supportive care, uh, the mortality rate is very, very high indeed. Um, that's not strictly true, of course. Uh, during the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, we did see that there actually was quite a wide range of symptoms. Um, and that, uh, you know, um, in many cases, patients had much milder symptoms than the sort of the classic sort of Hollywood version of the disease. Um, so, you know, a lot of patients, one of the telltale symptoms, for instance, was hiccups, right? Um, uh, not everyone bled out in this sort of uh, you know, horrifying way. Um, but yes, generally speaking, it has a much higher mortality rate um, because it's a blood-borne infection. Um, uh, you have to have very close contact with someone and be, uh, you know, have come into contact with their bodily fluid. So it doesn't just pass um, as an aerosol and respiratory droplets through the air. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, if you're very close to someone and you know, you get some of their spittle on you, uh, or, you know, you touch a surface where 
been contaminated and then you touch your eye or something. In that sense, you know, it is quite transmissible, but it doesn't really transmit, you know, in a way that a true respiratory aerosol pathogen such as influenza or COVID does. And we'll, we'll talk about Zika. That was from 2014. And I don't think a lot of people have heard of it, actually. Uh, so where does that originate from and how were they able to contain it? Well, I mean, Zika has been, was first recognized in 1947 um, in Uganda. Um, so um, it's been, we knew about Zika for a long time. Um, the, this is one of the key themes of my book um, because, um, you know, a lot of this is about scientific knowledge. Um, so scientists first uh, typed, identified the virus in Uganda it was then seen to cause mild uh, illnesses in humans. So there were outbreaks in Africa. And then, you know, in the 80s, 90s, uh, the, it was seen, the kind of the virus kind of spread. It spread it's basically a little bit of the history of Zika. So Zika is a mosquito born disease. It's spread by Aedes uh, mosquito. It's the same mosquito that spreads, spreads yellow fever and dengue. Um, but unlike those diseases, which are very serious diseases, have long been recognized, um, Zika was just uh, typically caused as this like, kind of mild rash-like illness. So you might have a fever uh, and a rash, but then it would resolve typically within uh, 48 hours to three days. Um, and, you know, there'd be no further consequences. Well, people thought there were no further consequences. But what happened in the 80s and 90s is that um, the... Uh, Zika spread along with the Aedes mosquito uh, throughout uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent and then Southeast Asia. And then there were like outbreaks on remote uh, Pacific island chains. Um, and eventually in 2015, it reached uh, Brazil. I'm not sure how it reached Brazil, there are lots of different theories. But once again, nobody in Brazil had ever been exposed to this virus before. And the outbreaks in Brazil were very much larger, and more explosive than outbreaks that had previously been seen anywhere else in the world. Many more people were sick. But the key thing that was different in Brazil, or what was seen to be different, is that the outbreak co coincided with uh, lots of women who had been infected in the first trimester of pregnancy, giving birth to children with um, microcephalus and other congenital neurological conditions. Uh, and so everyone, uh, I hope, should still remember those horrific pictures that came out of Brazil in 2015-16 of these babies with shrunken heads, much smaller heads, uh, head circumferences than a healthy baby. Uh, many of the babies were born deaf, blind, or not being able to see their mother's faces. And as a result of this, they didn't develop normally. And, they're still, they will be profoundly disabled all their lives. So in Brazil, there are thousands of women families still living with um, the consequences of Zika. But the point I wanted to make is that, so Zika been around for a long time, and we knew quite a lot about it, but there was a lot that we didn't know. Uh, so in terms of um, medical epistemology, uh, the philosophy of science, you know, this can be characterized as um, an unknown known. So we knew about it, but there was so much that was unknown about it that it took us by surprise, right? We weren't prepared for all those unknown things because we just didn't know about them. Um, it was only after the outbreak in Brazil that people went back and looked more closely at outbreaks that had occurred um, uh, in, South, in islands of Southeast Asia and realized that there were some um, unusual microcephalic births then, as well as other strange neurological conditions that retrospectively people said, oh, this was connected to Zika. Um, so yeah, but Zika is a very good model of the sort of threats we're facing now with climate change, because like many of these pathogens, so because it's um, uh, a mosquito-borne disease, um, you know, if you don't treat uh, the conditions, the environmental conditions that allow the Aedes mosquito to breed and replica replicate, particularly in urban areas, you know, favelas in Brazil, where people don't have um, uh, 
regular water supplies. So they have to keep buckets of water for bathing and laundry and cooking in their backyard. And those open uh, pails of water are ideal breeding grounds for the larvae of all sorts of mosquitoes, but particularly Aedes aedes. Um, and um, it's very simple to stop Zika and other mosquito-borne diseases. You basically just clean up all the areas where, where these mosquitoes can breed. And if you get rid of them, you interrupt the life cycle of the, of, of the virus. Um, and these lessons have been well known in public health. Um, you know, um, uh, yellow fever was eradicated from Brazil in the 1930s, 40s, but it's come back in recent years because of the breakdown of basically basic public health hygiene systems. And I'll ask you about one more pandemic and then I'll, we'll, we'll turn to the future. So uh, an interesting one I, I, I found reading was the 1929-1930 great parrot fever. Now, I've, I've never heard of that one. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, um, what I do in the book, just to explain um, to listeners who haven't read it, um, is that I canvas um, nine epidemics and pandemics. Well, it was originally eight, actually, but it, with COVID-19, I wrote, um, quickly wrote the chapter and added it to the paperback. Um, but the point was to sort of illustrate the different ways in which um, scientists were continually being blindsided and caught unawares um, by the emergence of you know, unusual pathogens. Um, and parrot fever is a good example because, um, you know, looking back, People might like raise a wry smile, parrot fever, was there such a thing as that? Surely it couldn't have been a real disease. Uh, but in the 1930s, um, this caused a panic, you know, and um, it was taken up by um, all the sort of mass market newspapers, the Hearst newspaper group in America, the sort of, you know, the tabloid yellow press of its day, uh, you know, carried headlines every day of the week about a new outbreak of parrot fever in Baltimore or Chicago, you know, so it spread very rapidly across the United States, but there were also outbreaks in London, in Berlin, and something like 12 countries worldwide saw outbreaks of parrot fever. So what was it? Parrot fever was, a trend, it was basically, it's a bacterium. It's in the chlamydiae family. Um, and it's typically harbored by wild parakeet and parrot. So uh, that includes, you know, the large sort of talking uh, African style parrot, but more typically parakeets or as they're known in Australia, budgerigar, right? So if you go into the, um, the bush in Australia, uh, you know, typically uh, budgies will harbor uh, this, uh, this bacteria and they'll live in harmony with it, right? Because um, they're used to it. Um, they have um, uh, immunizing, they've been immunized typically as chicklets in the nest, and that they survive infection uh, when, they're, um, when they're young. They grow into adulthood, they are not affected by the virus, but they still harbor and can transmit it. Uh, and if somebody who has had no experience or exposure to it comes into contact with that virus, they can uh, get a very severe pneumonia, right? Um, so what happened in the United States in um, uh, Christmas of 1929, is that outbreaks started to occur in Baltimore and other cities. And these outbreaks were typically associated with um, people who had recently acquired a pet parakeet from a local, um, uh, you know, a local bird store. So in this period, it was, um, uh, you know, people liked uh, to keep parakeets and, and parrots uh, in their homes because they could be trained to do all sorts of tricks, uh, widows or lonely housewives uh, could talk to their parrots. They would sort of, you know, entertain them and chatter during the day. This was in the period before people had TV, the internet, or even, you know, FM radio. So it was a source of entertainment of company. Um, you know, uh, if you were courting uh, someone, it was typical for, for men to present parakeets around Thanksgiving or Christmas time as a token of their affection. They were called lovebirds for that reason. Um, but a lot of these birds were actually trapped um, uh, in the Amazon, in the um, Brazilian Amazon. Um, and what happened in uh, the end of 1929 
is that there was an outbreak of psittacosis. Uh, psittacosis is parrot flea, but that's a technical known name. Uh, lots of birds fell ill. Uh, the Brazilians actually banned the trade because they realized it posed a risk, but a lot of unscrupulous bird dealers simply took those parrots, uh, parakeets, and sold them to Americans visiting um, uh, Buenos Aires or, or in other cities of these big cruise ships. And the result was that people imported these sickly birds to the United States, not realizing they were harboring this deadly pathogen. Uh, and um, public health authorities only really woke up to the threat when they had reports of uh, typically, you know, um, elderly couples um, suddenly falling ill with these very severe pneumonias and rapidly dying. Uh, but it took sort of many uh, weeks and months of detective work for them to sort of connect these pneumonias to the parrot. All right, I'll ask you about the future now. Um, I, I don't suppose you know well, I, I hope you know better than know most future. people. Um, but I'm going to ask you about uh, uh, the, the prospects for a vaccine. Uh, how optimistic are you? Well, I mean, look, there was an excellent program on Channel 4 just last night um, where they interviewed, um, you know, the Oxy, Oxford Vaccine Group, um, you know, that is you know, the forefront. And um, they're very hopeful that, they, that their vaccine will work. Uh, but it's really only it's only just gone into large scale trials um, because we've suppressed infection now in Britain. There aren't enough people who are getting infected that you can really test this vaccine. So they've had to go to Brazil. Um, so I think it's highly unlikely that this vaccine is going to be um, available to be deployed en masse so that you and I can just walk into our GPs and request it anytime soon. Um, you know, all the scientific experts say best hope, you know, maybe this time next summer, right? Mm. Uh, but even that isn't guaranteed. Um, you know, you have to realize that most vaccines fail. I mean, what I mean by fail is they might, um, you know, uh, show some promise in the early initial clinical trial, but it's only after they've been tested uh, widely on population and that they've been seen uh, not to cause adverse events and to really um, you know, improve the chances of surviving or not getting the disease that they can be licensed. The good news is the Federal Drug Administration of the United States has lowered the threshold for licensing a vaccine because this pandemic is so serious. They're saying, well, rather than you know, setting the benchmark like everyone who gets the vaccine has to, you know, not get COVID or 80%. They've said as long as 50% of people can be stopped getting COVID with this vaccine, we will license it. Okay, so that's really good because, you know, that's really the main hurdle, you know, the sort of actual licensing and passing the test. Um, but I think we really have to be cautious of being over, overly optimistic simply because um, most vaccines fail. I believe in the last um, 20 years, we've only actually developed something like six or seven new vaccines, right? Uh, I mean, that's a stunning thing to think about. That's not very many. Never developed a vaccine against HIV AIDS, uh, never developed a vaccine against SARS. Um, I suppose the good news, the one good news in, in that list is we did develop a vaccine against Ebola. Uh, and that has now been deployed um, very successfully in outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, by the way, many of your listeners may not realize that there are other outbreaks going on which are very serious, including a further outbreak in the DRC. Um, so it's not just COVID-19. Uh, we need vaccines against a whole host of diseases that we know pose hypothetical pandemic threats. Okay, I'll, I'll finish with this one. Uh, how optimistic are you that we're going to learn from COVID-19, the mistakes made, and do you think we'll be better prepared next time for a future pandemic, which at the start of the interview you did say would, like, would be likely to come? Well, uh, I mean, so I hope we'll be better prepared. Um, but the sort of the history of pandemics um, tells you that um, they 
are prone to what I call a cycle of panic and neglect. So at the time of pandemics going on, um, everyone's very interested in it. And you, know, you read about it all the time in the newspapers. And young people like yourself even become interested in medicine and medical history and want to interview me and ask me about it. I'm afraid that's not true in the interpandemic period. So, you know, even if so, the 1918 pandemic is, is, is a case in point. Um, it was it's only relatively recently that historians become interested in it and have started to research and write about it. Um, you know, for the longest period, it was neglected by historians who the far more the far more compelling story was the story of the First World War. Uh, and it, it acquired a reputation, a historiographical reputation, as the forgotten pandemic, even though it caused, uh, you know, in excess of 50 million deaths worldwide. Um, SARS uh, in 2002, um, at the time, people said this is the first, you know, jet set disease. Uh, we're seeing, you know, that, you know, a disease could suddenly emerge and cause a global pandemic. Afterwards, of course, there was a flurry of research funding. Uh, people were very interested in developing drugs and investigating vaccines. But within a year or so, that funding and interest dropped off and people ceased to talk about it. Um, so I think to answer your, your, your question directly, I hope and I think COVID-19 is different precisely because it's had these massive economic impacts. So even if hopefully, um, you know, we get a vaccine or, you know, for one reason or other, the infection mysteriously disappears and stops causing, you know, hospitalization, we're not likely to forget it because we're going to be living with the economic consequences for many months and years to come, right? Um, that is not true of previous epidemics or pandemics. They didn't generally have deep, long-lasting economic impacts in the way that we already think COVID-19 will. Um, and I think we'll realize, or I hope we'll realize that, you know, when we're weighing the, those ec economic impacts, which the World, um, World Bank now estimates could cost the global economy as much as 10 to $12 trillion, which is a colossal sum, I can't even imagine it. And you weigh that against spending, say, $8 billion on vaccine technology platforms, investing in research, not into coronaviruses, because by the way, there are many more out there that could hypothetically cause another pandemic, but also other viruses like Ebola, like Lassa fever, like Nipah virus, many of which are also harbored by bats and already have caused outbreaks in Southeast Asia. You know, so we need to spend money on all of these things. And the amount of money that we need to spend is a fraction of the cost of what could you know, be incurred economically if we didn't do that. So I think it makes sense you know, from our own rational self-interest to do that. But I'm not hopeful because I know that um, the political cycle and also the news cycle is a very sort of short term, right? So we can't seem to think of more than four or five year political cycles. Um, but with pandemics, we have to plan for the long term. We have to plan in a hundred year cycle, right? Um, but this is really a subset of a much bigger problem, which is climate change. Because what's driving these pandemic viruses is also the same thing that's driving global warming. You know, the way that uh, climate change and global heating is um, disrupting the ecologies, the natural ecologies, the, the habitats in which bats and other other animals wild animals who, ha who live with these viruses, uh, displacing those animals and bringing them more into contact with human populations, and therefore making it more likely that um, any number of these viruses could trigger an, uh, a new epidemic or pandemic. Um, and that really requires really long-term thinking, right? Not only about the impacts on us today for our generation, but on future generations, right? Um, and that, that raises different moral questions because we're not only talking about the moral economy for people alive today, but the impacts of our decisions or lack of decisions on people who aren't even born. 
Okay, Mark Honigsman, thanks for your time. Thank you. Very good questions. I'm very happy to do the interview.